This was all sparked by a swimming pool, a swimming pool on Virgin Voyages Scarlet Lady. Just after I boarded, I was looking at the pool, wondering why on earth it was so small for a ship that carries around 3,000 passengers. What were the ship architects and the line thinking? Why on earth had they done it? But this got me thinking then about other things that I've seen on cruise ships that seem a bit off or a bit odd. So I set myself a mission to find out exactly why. I'm Gary Bembridge and I'm going to tell you what I found out about why things that don't seem to make sense on a ship actually do when you know why. So why exactly are cruise ship pools like that one on Scarlet Lady so small? When I stay in a Las Vegas resort, the hotels with say 5,000 guests have vast pools, but not so on a ship of similar passenger numbers. At best, the swimming pools on cruise ships are 20 foot by 40 foot by 5 foot deep. And I found out there are three key reasons for that. First of all, water is extremely heavy and the water in that modest sized pool alone weighs around 250,000 pounds. This risks making the ship really top heavy and challenging to sail and keep stable when you're sailing the seas. So size needs to be limited. And then the pools have to be in the middle of the ship and dead center of the deck to help with the balance. The ones at the rear are always much, much smaller. That's also why you always see hot tubs mirroring each other with one on both sides of the ship in exactly the same position. Again, it's to balance out the weight. Secondly, the more weight at the top of the ship, the more counterbalancing weight has to be added to the base of the ship to keep it stable. This, of course, wastes more space lower down and adds more weight to the ship. Now, to get around this problem, the old cruise liners from the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, like Cunard's QE2, they used to have the pool inside the ship and at the very bottom. In QE2's case, it was actually around about the waterline. Nowadays, passengers expect pools to be out in the sunlight and so they have to be at the top of the ship. This actually magnifies the risk of throwing the ship off balance in rougher weather especially when the water starts moving around. You have all that weight moving around. So that's also why pools are often drained and emptied when the seas get rough. And thirdly, real estate and space is at a premium on a ship and lots and lots of deck space is needed for guests like me to lie out in the sun and keeping the pool small means more space to be able to do that. One way the cruise lines disguise the small size of pools is by having that area around the pool that just has a few inches of water. It creates the effect of having bigger pools and also practically, of course, it means more passengers can sort of cool off. The next oddity is that any premium cabin or suites that I've stayed in are actually located in some of the worst parts of the ship, the worst for movement and risk of getting seasick. I once had dinner with a ship architect. It was actually at a Silver Sea event in a shipyard. And he told me there are two key problems he faces when adding suites to cruise ships when he's designing them. First of all, he's required by the lines to put suites high up and also forward in the front of the ship and rear or the aft of the ship because that's where the views are best and that's what premium passengers expect. Now he actually said the best place for premium cabins which would have the least amount of movement and the smoothest sailing even in rougher weather would actually be pretty low down, ideally sort of deck six or deck seven and of course in the middle of the ship. This is not where premium cabins normally are. Now I remember seeing that in action when we were in rough seas on Queen Victoria, we were sailing between Hawaii and New Zealand. And our cabin was midships and we had not really felt this rough weather pr pretty much. We were invited to a cocktail party in the very best cabin, a Q1, at the rear of the ship. It was higher up and we basically struggled to stand as the ship kind of moved up and down in the waves, which we didn't feel in our cabin. The second issue the architect faced was that suites tend to have marble bathrooms and lavish features, all of which are heavy and add much more weight. And as we saw with the swing pools, they, these are being added to the top of the ship that again need to be counterbalanced to stop the ship being top heavy and less stable. One cruise ship addition that seemed like a really unnecessary gimmick to me at first is the so-called magic carpet. This first appeared on the side of Celebrity Cruises Edge class of ships, so Edge, Apex and soon beyond. Now much was made of its dining and bar features and it could move up and down the side of the ship to create these wonderful different dining experiences. But it did seem a rather unnecessary and costly add-on, 
all while making the ship itself kind of feel a bit unsymmetrical design-wise because it's only on one side of the ship. However, I discovered it's really there to solve a major problem and a big bottleneck when cruising, and that's getting passengers on and off the ship when they have to tender. Tendering is when ships cannot dock in a port and the ship has to ferry guests to and from land to go on tours and explore. It's a really time consuming and very frustrating experience as anyone who's cruised will know. That's true for the crew and for the passengers. Now the real role of the magic carpet is to solve that problem, not provide new dining and bar options. That's just a bonus. So it's lowered to sea level when the ship's moored and provides a huge platform to be able to process loads of guests on and off the tenders, greater numbers. It also means importantly, the ship carries much larger tender boats that can carry many, many more guests per trip. As ships get bigger and bigger and the ports get busier, they often have to tender guests and the magic carpet improves and speeds all of that up. That's the real reason it's there. Another odd aspect about cruising and cruise ships is how gratuities or tips if you prefer to call them that, have changed over the last 15 years since I started cruising, certainly. They've moved from being a discretionary reward I gave to selected crew members for great service into a compulsory charge. I am no longer left to decide how much and which crew members I give tips to. The lines have turned those into part of the cruise fare, basically, and they've become a fixed rate charge per person per day. And I have to either prepay them before boarding or my onboard account is charged every single day with them. It's not linked to service I get, and I have no say over who gets them. This is not how it works on land. I don't hand over a tip before I get service at say a land-based restaurant. I only pay it afterwards based on the service. So why have the lines done this? Gratuities have traditionally been a really key part of crew earnings. They earn a base salary, but tips increase what they take home significantly. Now, the lines argue they've moved from the totally discretionary approach, which meant some or many passengers would actually not pay any tips to this new system, which they claim assists crew by ensuring all guests are contributing into the tips fund and also then ensures a wider pool of crew benefit from tips. However, in reality, it means that lines have taken control of gratuity money. They now have a sizable pot of money to use and they can allocate that money as they want to. Now, skeptics argue this means they can now keep the crew base pay that they cover and of course their costs at a pretty low level. They minimize the cost of the line because they now have these funds that they can top up wages to a more acceptable level. Now, I'd like to think it's the first reason, but many crew I talk to definitely say they prefer the old approach. Gratuities have been turned increasing from a bonus I can give to selected crew members for good service, basically to a thinly disguised base salary top up that the cruise line now controls and manages. Now, of course, it does probably make sense for the lines, but it feels it's come at a cost to passengers in terms of money and in terms of control. Another feature of cruise ships, even the ultra luxury ones, is as soon as I step on board, the selling begins to get me to spend, spend, and spend. Tables with goods outside stores, constant flies in my cabin offering drinks of the day, jewelry, watches, spa treatments, add-on excursions. It just goes on and on and on. And everywhere you turn, it feels like someone is trying to sell me something. So why do cruise lines actually do this? I found out this is basically because of the way that the cruise business model has evolved. A really important and big chunk of cruise line profits come from what people spend on board, not the actual fare itself. Now, industry reports that I've found say that people, say like me, will spend between 50% and 100% on top of what my fare is once I'm actually on board the ship. So that's for things like drinks, Wi-Fi excursions, spa treatments, shopping, casino bingo, and so on. Now, each of those items have really big margins and has become a really big part of the cruise line profits. So lines are always trying to sail their ships full for that very reason. They aim to fill every single cabin, even if they have to discount cabins close to sailing because so much money, so much of their profits is made on board. Now, you can get a sense of just how much money they make from those extras by how much fares increased 
recently when lines like celebrity cruises moved to be more in all inclusive, Holland America brought in their have it all fare. So that includes, for example, an excursion, signature drinks package, one specialty dining and Wi-Fi. And I have seen fares increase on those sort of lines by at least $350 per person for a seven night cruise on those lines. So you get a sense of just how big and important those things are. Now, if you want to find out about other unusual and little discussed aspects of cruising, I've got two other videos you can watch right now in this playlist I've put together here. So why don't you take a look at that and enjoy learning a little bit more about some unusual things about cruising.